I'm going to talk about trauma, how it affects the physiology and anatomy of your brain, and thereby translate it to how your brain shifts will affect your behaviors and how your behaviors will affect your relationships and our life is measured by the quality of our relationships. It doesn't matter how much you've got, it doesn't matter what you have, if you've got nobody smiling at you and your goldfish will turn around when you walk in the room, you've <laughs> got nothing. It's all about relationships. So what oftentimes when we talk about trauma and PTSD, we think about the trauma that people experience as a result of military trauma. More of post-military personnel die as an aftermath of the trauma suffered in battle. They die outside of the battlefield when they come back rather than being killed in battle. So that itself is a huge problem. Today I want to specifically address the kind of trauma that exists outside the military arena because there itself is a big problem but we have a much bigger problem at home. As I said, when trauma affects us, it changes us physically. When it changes our brain physically, it changes how we relate to the people who are dear to us. And at the end of the day, there is very poor quality of life. A little bit brain science here. That's the <coughs> control subject. And that's the PTSD brain. The amygdala is the part of your brain that controls how you feel. So a PTSD brain is constantly lit up. It's hyperactive. We know in, in basic physiology, when we're stressed out and we're doing the flight and fight mode, we are ready to run, we are ready to defend ourselves, right? Now if we are constantly, our body is in that mode, your amygdala becomes hyperactive. <clears throat> You're there all the time. As I studied and gathered information in this area, I remember a long time ago, I was doing work with uh, a man who has been a post-Vietnam veteran, and we were walking in to dinner. And we were sitting down, and he would not sit with his back to the door. And he, we changed tables three times until he was comfortable. And I said, hey, I said, you are one picky man. You know that the amygdala is the part of our brain that controls our emotion. And this is the part of the brain that does all the processing. Now I look at you and, and I figure, oh, I remember your name because somewhere stored here, I met you a year ago, blah, blah, blah. I can't remember exactly when, can't remember your name, but I know I've met you before because I have processing power here. And, and then the other part of the brain, so basically when we are constantly bombarded by traumatic events, three parts of the brain we want to pay attention to. Your processing center is dimmed down. You can't remember how many of you had experience when you've had a lot of emotional upset. You don't remember things. Oh, how did I forget how to get there? I think I remember Steve's brother, who is a commercial driver, who has gone to his home his, his parents' home in Ohio many, many times. The evening he flew home because his father was dying, he got lost. He got lost and he drove around for two hours. He couldn't find his way home. Here is a CDL driver who, drove, who drives across country. So extreme stress can shut down your thinking brain. 
It causes your emotional brain to be hyperactive and the hippocampus which facilitates the two is kind of like had a bit too much to drink, <laughs> a little wonky. So it doesn't work very well. And if you like to look at brain slices, you will see that this part here, your hippocampus shrinks compared to there, and your cerebral cortex, also, your brain gets smaller. Your brain gets smaller. And then the parts that respond to your emotional being becomes hyperactive. So it is like your brain is your house and your amygdala becomes the Christmas lights around the house and your house shrinks and your amygdala becomes hyperactive. Here's what happens uh, in the long term after constant chronic assaults, right? Your hippocampus volume gets smaller and it is not able to process as we normally process. For example, um, if I accidentally spill your mug of tea, all right? It's not a big deal, right? I'll buy you another cup of tea. I'll pay for your dry cleaning bill. Okay, and your hippocampus is able to process, oh, it's Kuitai. Kuitai is my friend. She's good for a couple bucks to clean up my, my sweater, and she has lots of tea in her house. It'll be all right. <laughs> However, if Lynn had a PTSD, a traumatized brain, her hippocampus volume is now much smaller. She cannot process it in that way. And the spilling a cup of tea immediately takes her back to the last time a cup of tea was accidentally spilled and a kind man said, let me help you, took her away in the corner and raped her. Okay? So when Kuitai spills a cup of tea that Lin has, Lin's brain will not see this is just my friend who accidentally spilled my cup of tea. Wham! Goes right back to the event of this ugly man on top of her, raping her. That is what we call ab reaction, that the past event is now brought back into the instant, into the present, and you are there as if you were back in that situation. So. In hypnotherapy language, we call it a moment of ab reaction. Most people will call it a flashback. And she may have a memory of Kuitai being the total klutz. <laughs> Last Christmas, you did the same thing. Kuitai, you spilled eggnog on my red sweater. What is this? You know, she remembers, but she's not ready to claw my eyeballs out. A flashback is when you instantly, a past traumatic event is still very much in what I call T0, in the moment. If you read Basil van der Kolt's book, he talks about a case called Thomas, who's a veteran, who's come back, has a successful career, but he cannot enjoy 4th of July with his family. He hears the firecrackers instead of looking at it as one of many Fourth of July events he's attended in his life. He's right there in the battlefield where his buddies were all slaughtered and he was the only survivor. So he crawls under the bed. So we see, uh, and I think all, some, many of you are nodding your head, you know what I'm talking about. So your clients come to you who have traumatized brains and they can't stop ab reacting. They cannot turn their, their, their memories into just memories. Their memories are still in flashback mode. And they continue to suffer, even though it's 40 years after the event. Simply put, a traumatized brain translates to a person who abreacts frequently, who is hypervigilant, 
who has to have things a certain way to keep control. Or you will find that many veterans who come back from battle scars, they feel numb because they don't feel. Or worse still, they go see some people who would medicate them. I had worked with a veteran long time ago in my Georgia office. He said, please help me. I am tired of going to the VA. Nobody even sees me. They see, they call my name, they look at my chart, they renew my script for sleeping pills and what have you they give me. Nobody talks to me, nobody sees me. So, these things happen, these are what we call the silent victims. The silent victims. So as we look at it, I made up this little diagram. You have um, loss of purpose on the spiritual level. You cannot feel joy. You have no sense of self-worth, even though they hold, you know, some of them are very successful professionals outside but inside, they feel like every day they are lying. I feel like a fraud. Every day I go in and I, 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 I take care of my clients. But when I come home, you know, I'm still that scared little person inside. And they're constantly reliving their crisis. It never goes away. And so translated to the mental part here, this part, you suffer from flashbacks and depression, anxiety, panic attacks. You can pull out your DSM book and put it on top of them, okay? But simply put, they are so scared they cannot relate and their family members suffer. Then physically, these are the people whose symptoms you get to hear about. Panic attacks, self-mutilation, and you'll find that many of this particular person, Tom, that Vandercote talks about in his book, his hobby is fast motorcycle riding. They like to get in extreme sports in order to feel something. Ordinary, ordinarily, day to day, they are numb. They can't feel, so they do crazy things to be able to feel. Um, they can't sleep, so you medicate. They can't eat properly or they have disordered eating. And it translates to a whole plethora of medical issues. And so you go see this specialist and see that specialist. Very soon you become a walking cupboard of pills. A lot of times your brain gets to be so numb and so small that you can't feel. We know that there are several things that we can do. The good news is your brain is plastic. That all the trauma that you suffer, if your brain has shrunk, if your brain has changed, most people say by the time you're 25, you can't learn any more new things because you're set. Well, scientists have discovered that it is not true. There's a whole bunch of scientific evidence to show you that we are constantly changing. So that if we've suffered trauma here and our brain no longer functions as they should, good news is we can change it. It has been shown that we can rewire your brain. And I know that hypnosis can help you reset the misaligned compass that you suffered as a result of trauma. So we know hypnotherapy can help you rewire your brain. We know, how many of you are familiar with EMDR? How many of you are trained in EMDR? You know that EMDR is a very small part of hypnotherapy. <laughs> and that basically EMDR helps you repattern your brain in a certain way. 
So when we use hypnosis, we bypass your critical factor, we go right into your subconscious mind, and we can help you reprogram your brain. And it happens very, very quickly. Yoga and breathing and meditation and imagery, all these things help us slow down and recalibrate. We can all recalibrate and we can all teach our, patient, our clients to recalibrate. And the work that I do that involves energy is Qigong and learning how to get inside your body and learning how to breathe and move your energies can realign your brains. Yep. So we find that a lot of times we see war as out there in the military where you can see people with guns. We are constantly living and working in a war zone. We're being constantly assaulted by weapons we can't even see. So today, if nothing else, I'd like to raise the awareness that we have such a thing as our domestic war zone. It's constant. You work with them every day.